my goodness. Oh, man. Where to start? I mean, you look at all these topics that we've had today, and it's kind of like, I would have liked to talk about that one. You give me another few hours, and I will. But the fact of the matter is, I got 40 minutes. I tried to buy more time. Dave said he would ask me to speak on the First Amendment. If I wouldn't ask for more time, I tried to buy it. And she wouldn't give it to me. She's got too much integrity. But the fact of the matter is, I've got to be sensitive to your time here also. He asked me to speak on the First Amendment. And I started, my mind just started racing. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's such an immense topic. How am I going to cover this? And so I spent dozens of hours and created 243 slides. You notice it's not plugged in? Last night I had what Tammy calls a stumper of thought. You remember in Doctrine and Covenants section 9, verse 9, where this stupor of thought thing happens? Last night at 10.30, I was reviewing my 243 slides, and I thought, you know what? I can't even read these in the time I've been given. And let alone diverge, as I am loath to do. I do it all the time. And so I got a stumper of thought, as Tammy puts it. And I set my 243-slide presentation aside, and I remember the Doctrine and Covenants, section 50, where it talks about speaking by the Spirit and receiving by the Spirit. And so I would ask you today to take the topics that were given, all of them, not just this one, and take the time on your own to seek by the power of the Spirit and understanding. It is far better to receive an understanding that way than by some speaker that, that poorly presents, in mortal words, the issues. I'll give you an idea, just a quick one, and I've got to move on to the First Amendment. I always do this to myself, but last week I was speaking back east at a, as a keynote speaker at a physician's uh, convention. I spoke on nullification, and you think, what do physicians want to know about this for? Well, they did really want to know about it, it turns out, but the fact of the matter is, Six years ago, I created a nullification resolution for our legislature here. And I won't tell you how it got shunted to ground, for those of you that know anything about electronics. It went nowhere. It's only three pages long. It's a generic nullification resolution. You fill in the blanks of what you're trying to nullify, and you put the state in, and you put the dates on, and that's about it. I mean, the rest of it's there, and I didn't have to make any of it up. I took the words of the principal author of the Declaration of Independence and the father of the Constitution, so Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. I just took their words and in three pages capsulized the concept of nullification. Okay, now when I, I gave it to the legislature, I thought I had a friend that's even attended with us here in the past that would carry this in the legislature. Nothing came of it. And I contacted him again. I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, I gave it to another individual that will never attend here because he's an enemy of this movement. He's the principal conspirator about concons. Some of you may have heard of him. But the fact of the matter is, he says, I gave it to him because our con he's our go-to constitutional guy. And he said he would write a nullification resolution. Well, he put a resolution out that was said nullification on it, but it didn't say anything about nullification, okay? So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to push this, and, and finally he says, well, there's two problems with it, Scott. He said, it's too long. Three pages? I says, how long's Obamacare? And, uh, and he says, well, uh, nobody understood it. And so with, without any priming or anything like that, I, I turned to my Tamara and I said, take this resolution and tell me what you think about it. She came back in a short period, it's only three pages long. I mean, she was like the chief cheerleader all of a sudden. Handsprings and everything else. We can, do, can we do that? Really? Oh my goodness. She was so excited and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you understand it? Said, well, yes. Did you read it? Yes. Oh, so here's the thing. She read it and thereby understood it. How? I told people in this convention last week, I said, 
she's a homeschooling mother and grandmother. She knows how to think. So I'm going to ask you to just do something here. Think. And then a second thing, which she did too, is feel. Because it's by the power of the Spirit that we come to, th to understand things if we've given them a place in our heart. And I must tell you that, that the things that we have talked about today are, we've just scratched the surface. It's kind of like a scratch and sniff thing that you get in a, in a birthday card or something. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't get them. They smell like chocolate chip cookies or something for, you know, my grandkids give me. Anyway, we've just had a scratch and sniff today. But the, the depth and breadth and the importance of these things is beyond understanding. And some of you may know that I'm, I, I talk often about being, about uh, con-cons being, a fatal flaw. Anybody that wants a Constitution Convention is fatally flawed. And I've been asked the question, is that the only fatal flaw? And I say, no, it's not. These things that are found in the in you know habeas corpus and ex post facto laws, and these things like what's found, the, the five elements in the First Amendment, the Second Amendment that's just been talked about, I mean, every one of those, if anybody crosses those, they are fatally flawed. If anybody wishes to cross those off your list, these weren't created in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution or the Declaration or by Parliament or by the King or by potentates or anybody. These are those inalienable rights that God declared ours as his children. And when we got this Constitution and its marvelous Bill of Rights, they were vouchsafed to us. They were further declaratory and restrictive clauses put upon the government to prevent them from overstepping those. And the Ninth Amendment covered a thing that said, even if we didn't mention one of these things, we still got them. See, they didn't say anything about what color shoelaces you wear, how many kids you can have, if you're gonna have a picket fence or a chain link fence or a color of a roof, none of that stuff. Those are all your rights to choose. But if in fact you and your spouse are discussing are we going to put rose-colored carpet or dusty blue carpet in the living room? Those things don't matter. But these other things are fundamental to everything you hold dear. And so I say to you that this First Amendment, for example, holds some of those most fundamental rights, and if we lose them, we're in trouble. And there are those, either through a con-con or by guess and by golly, are trying to scooch those out of the way. Two years and one month ago, there was a civil rights commission that was convened in Washington, D.C., and they said specifically, we need to define religious liberties as narrowly as possible so that they don't infringe upon these other rights that we have created. Okay, these gender bender rights and uh, race rights and all these other kind of things. And so your right to worship your God and that right can't just be an institutional right. And I think that's where Senate Bill 296 in 2015 not only drove off the rails, it went off the, into the weeds and it went off the cliff. It violated ancient scripture, modern scripture, the mentors of the founders, the words of the founders, the United States Constitution, and the Utah Constitution. And nobody in our legislature even gave a thought to it. And among those things that were lost were two things out of the three that are mentioned in the 34, 134th chapter of the Doctrine and Covenants. Verse 2, it says there are three things that are needful if you're to have freedom. One is life. So that abortion stuff is kind of a fatal flaw too, isn't it? Because you can't, if you don't have life, you ain't got freedom, Okay. But the other two are private property and the free exercise thereof and the freedom of conscience. Senate Bill 296 said if you are a certain size organization or if you rent so many facilities or if you're not a church or the Boy Scouts, you lose the things that I mentioned that those other people supported. And I cannot believe for the life of me to this day no one has ever said that in front of the courts. It's absurd. But our own legislature here was, was reducing our religious liberties, taking away our property rights, our right to contract, 
Article 1, Section 10, the states can't intervene in. If you want to rent, if you don't want to rent to me because I'm ugly, that's your choice. There's any reason. You don't have to have a reason. But we took away the right to contract in the state of Utah. Okay. So we have these, how many minutes have I got? Oh, three or four hours. Okay, good. You heard her. <laughs> You've heard about the, this thing, the Constitution, where anything more or less than it, you've heard it scripturally, cometh of evil. You've heard about these good and wise and honest and wise that are supposed to be picked. It says wise twice. Who are the wise guys? Look at the 101st section, verses 77 through 80. Wise men whom I raised up for this very purpose. So God defined the wise guys. Who were those wise guys? The founding fathers of America. So their principles, their wisdom in their principles is what we must uphold or else whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. Okay? So this thing that God has endorsed, this United States Constitution, and I give some presentations about the parallels between the Book of Mormon government, their, their constitutional republic and ours, it is uncanny. No, it's not. They came from the same, the same source. You would be amazed at the parallels between the Book of Mormon Constitutional Republic and our Constitutional Republic, which we're moving very quickly, losing. Let me just, <clears throat> a couple, two or three things out of J. Reuben Clark. He's been mentioned today, and I, you know, holy cow, where to go? <laughs> I have said to you before, brethren, that to me the Constitution is part of my religion. In its place, it is just as much a part of my religion as any other part. Is it a part of my religion? Because it is one of those institutions which God has set up for his own purposes. And as one of the brethren said today, set up so that this church might be established. See, I can prove to you everywhere to Sunday that if the gospel, if the Constitution and the Bill of Rights had not been established, the gospel would not have been restored. It wouldn't have just been a tough deal. The brethren have said it could not have been restored. Okay, going on. Because under no other government in the world could the church have been established as it has been established under this government. So, brethren, I wish to, you to understand when we begin to tamper with the Constitution, we begin to tamper with the law of Zion, which God himself set up. And no one may trifle with the word of God with impunity. Okay, now, this next one is a sobering one. Because I, you know what, I, I have a weird genetic defect, I think. You know? I'm probably one of the only people in the whole world that's ever read the Patriot Act. Not only read it, but annotated it, cross-referenced it, and, and analyzed it. Same with this 28-page document that Gail was talking about earlier. I, there's, there's something wrong with me. But, but I like to go in and examine and think and understand and then use the basis of that by the power of the Spirit to decide where things are to go. One of the things I've spent an extraordinary amount of time, besides studying the founding principles of this nation, one of them is in, in the doctrines of the church and its establishment and historical perspective. And there are things that went on in the early days of this church, in this dispensation, that I will not talk about in mixed company. It's too brutal. It's too offensive. It's too oppressive. It's like some of my friends that we talk about experiences in the military that they will never talk about to anybody else. My kids always say, well, Dad, you must have really enjoyed your time in the military. It sounds like you had a great, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I only tell you about what I want you to hear about. But I won't talk about some of the things in the early days of the church that happened. And the, the people that Jack talked about in northern Italy, holy cow. If you have understood the brutality that they experienced, and the religious persecution and what happened to those peoples and somehow they hung on and they became early members of the church many of them but there's what J. Reuben Clark said I say unto you with all the soberness I can that we stand in danger of losing our liberties and that once lost only blood will bring them back and once lost we of this church will in order to keep the church going forward have more sacrifices to make and more persecutions to endure than we have yet known heavy as our sacrifices and grievous as our persecutions of the past have been. Oh, my friends. 
some of the things I want to weep about that happened 150, 170 years ago. And they've happened throughout history. And if we are going to have to experience those things once we lose these great liberties, I don't want anybody to have to do that. It's not just my immediate family, my grandchildren, whatever. It's yours and hundreds of thousands, millions of others that I don't even know that I prefer to have them be able to rejoice in these things. Captain Moroni, in the 46th chapter of Alma, took his coat and rent it. And he wrote upon it, in memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, our peace, and our wives, and our children. And he said that this should be able to stay with us as long as there's a band of Christians that are upon the land. And I think virtually all, if not all here, probably would claim that appellation. We claim to be Christians. But that thing about our God, our religion, our freedom, our peace, our wives, and our children, those six things is what we would die for. That's what we would go to war for. It has nothing whatsoever to do with foreign oil or about some treaty, some foolish, stupid treaty that people think modifies the Constitution and takes away the ability for Congress to even be able to declare war after a deliberative process that considers the lives, fortunes, and sacred honor of this nation under the constitutional principles and just war. And by the way, the 98 section of the Doctrine and Covenants talks about that at great length too. And we haven't had a just war, according to J. Reuben Clark's line of reasoning. I won't even ask how far you think it went back. You would be shocked. The War of 1812. The War of 1812, people, we have been violating this at that, that most onerous of things we were talking at our table earlier about some of the effects of war. Satan laughs. And we are a warlike people, according to President Kimball. Now, Dave, I know I'm far afield, and so I've got to use up the rest of my time with something else, right? We, if we don't understand these things, if we can't take the first God, religion, freedom, peace, Wives and children. We lose all of that if we lose the Constitution. And the First Amendment embodies so many of those things. This idea of freedom of speech, I'm going to come to the freedom of religion. I had like 160 slides on the freedom of religion on that presentation I was going to do. Freedom of speech and freedom of press were nothing whatsoever about obscenity and about profane words and about pornography and nude dancing and all those stupid things that they've decided it's about. The press and the speech were to protect our liberties. It was so that we could talk about and present to the people when, our, when those rights were being violated. And the federal election committees and, and the federal election laws and everything like that are direct, unequivocal, the McCain-Feinstein things. Huh? Fine gold? Fine gold. No, it's... Okay, anyway. Look it up. They're a direct infringement upon the First Amendment. You cannot have freedom of speech politically. Okay, the idea of... Well, we could go back to how the kings and potentates and everybody has violated the freedom of those things and the people were under tyranny. The founding fathers had lived that and they did not want us to have to do that. You like read about the freedom of assembly and, and petition. You know, clear back in, uh, let's go back to the uh, First Continental Congress in 1774 where they had tried to petition, they had tried to assemble, they had been dissolved by the king. He didn't want to hear about it. You look as late as Tiananmen Square in, the, in uh, 1989. Do you remember the picture of the, the, that student, I guess, we don't really know who he was. He's standing in, four of, in front of four tanks that are lined up against him. You, remember, you don't remember that? What a, you got to. Go look it up. You know, it's like all these peaceful demonstrators. You know what? There may have been 10,000 people killed when the government responded to their protests. See that right of petition and grievance and so on like that? That is in there so we don't have tanks come before us. An individual like, well, it's too much of a story. He, he was there. Some of you are old enough. I was in the service at this time, but... 
Some of you are old enough to remember the uh, moratoriums on the war back during Vietnam. Remember the marches in Washington, D.C., and some of them even here in Salt Lake City. This individual I know had graduated from VMI. They were better than West Point. <laughs> Spent a tour in Southeast Asia, came back. He, with his fellow soldiers, marshaled up at the, at the Jefferson Memorial in their web gear with their M16s with fixed bayonets to march on the Americans that were marching against that war. This friend of mine got so thoroughly sick because he had remembered what war was like and he couldn't see himself going against his fellow Americans and he got sick and, and they wouldn't let him go out on that. He volunteered for another tour in Southeast Asia because he didn't want to face this in America. But people, that was decades ago. We have gone so far. And this, this idea that it will never happen in America is absolutely shocking to me. If we read the Book of Mormon, and I'm absolutely, completely, and totally convinced that it was written for our day. And we have prophetic statements to that effect. And I'm absolutely, completely, and totally convinced that we got the stories in there that we got because they applied to us today. And if high priests were involved in the destruction of the constitutional republic, they were high priests in the church. Okay? And I can demonstrate that from here to Sunday with those that are currently in high positions that are destroying the rights of liberty, that are eviscerating those God-given blessings that we got with such great cost in that circumstance that bought us freedom and actually bought the restoration of the gospel. So, as again, another statement by J. Reuben Clark. The Constitution of the United States is a great and treasured part of my religion. The overturning or the material changing or the distortion of any fundamental principle of our constitutional government would thus do violence to my religion. In another statement, he said, and he says, there has been no fight in us, no more fight in us than there is in a bunch of sheep. And we've been much like sheep. Freedom was never bought, brought to a people on a silver platter, nor maintained with whisk brooms and lavender sprays. My grandma and grandpa, see, they had an outhouse, okay? And they got a indoor plumbing and flush toilet rather late in life. <laughs> and I remember in that bathroom when they got that, Grandma used to keep lavender sprays in there. <clears throat> it was a very superficial thing, but it was sweet and odorous. And I remember as a little kid going in and spray it. Anyway, we don't get freedom that way. It's gritty. It takes action on our part. We cannot meet, heat, and retreat, as Dave has often said to us. We must engage in this. How much time I got? Seven. How many? Seventeen. Seventeen. Holy cow. Great. Oh, wonderful. So, <coughs> <coughs> let me just point out a couple of things, and then I, got, I just need to have a couple of minutes at the end, so remind me of that, of something that President Hinckley said. And I want to leave that probably as a charge to all of us as we, we go there. But I alluded to this conference that was two years and one month ago. It was titled, Peaceful Coexistence, Reconciling Non-Discrimination Principles with Civil Liberties. It was a civil rights commission in Washington, D.C. And they were met to set official policy and give direction to legislators and policymakers in regards to limiting religious liberties. And here's what their commission chairman said. His name was Martin Castro. I don't know if he's a brother or what. But at any rate, his phraseology and everything like that is absolutely Marxist. He says, the phrases religious liberty and religious freedom will stand for nothing except hypocrisy. So long as they remain code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, or any form of intolerance. So he looks at religious liberty of the choices that you make to be some form that needs to be regulated in as narrow a scope as possible. In fact, I could go through a, 
a number of their, their recommendations, and I, there isn't time really to give this justice, but just know that there are efforts to re regulate your religiosity. It says, religious exemptions from non-discrimination laws and policies must be weighed carefully and narrowly defined on a fact-specific basis. Narrowly defined. Federal and state courts, lawmakers, policymakers at every level must tailor religious exemptions to civil liberties and civil rights protections as narrowly as applicable law requires. First Amendment free exercise clause rights only, are, are only for individuals and religious institutions only to the extent that they do not unduly burden civil rights and civil rights protections against status-based discrimination. That means the things that we created, not we, me, not you, but I mean that the, the current politically correct establishment is doing. All of these, like I, I said earlier, gender bender things and these things that have to do with race and, and uh, all, just anything that they can come up with, you're setting aside a constitutionally protected issue that God gave us initially. Now, when, the, when <clears throat> it was time to talk about the religious persecution that happened in Europe, that, in the early, that resulted in the early 1600s of mass migrations. You know, we, we know about the pilgrims in 1620. You know about the Puritans from 1630 to 1640, the 20,000 that came then, almost entirely for religious reasons. And even though they wanted to have religious freedoms, they, they didn't always tolerate that for others. And so seven states, even, by the time the Constitution was signed, still had state religions. And... Uh, Founders figured they'd figure that out sooner or later, but the fact of the matter is Jefferson thought this was dangerous and in 1779 he tried to get that changed in a Virginia thing. He finally succeeded in getting a religious liberties thing passed through Virginia legislature in 1786. It was a precursor to the First Amendment about nobody is going to be denied the privilege of religious worship. And then in the summer of 17. 87, the Congress came up with the Northwest Ordinance that said that no one was going to be persecuted for religious things, another precursor to the First Amendment. And so in the sixth uh, uh, article of the Constitution, there'll be no religious test, okay? There was open to these. We know that the great pillars, religion and morality, that George Washington talked about it in his, in his uh, farewell address. We know that John Adams said that the Constitution was written only for a religious and moral people. We know what the declaration of thanksgiving that George Washington gave at the direction of the Congress that had just that very day passed what became the First Amendment that said next month we're going to have a day of fasting or prayer, national day of fasting. We know that there was not this animosity to religion that has, has crept in through court case and through, through policy and through legislative action and everything else like that. If we lose our religious liberty, the, I know this Senate Bill 296 thing. I won't tell you everything I think about it because we don't have an hour and a half for you to understand how egregious this thing is. But if you want to hear that presentation, I'll do that one too. But the fact of the matter is, there was an attempt with that to protect an institution's religious liberty. If we look at it that narrowly, the time will come when the religious liberty of institutions is questioned. You won't just be able to worship in your church and in your temple. We've got to draw the line much further down. It's got to be on individual God-given rights. And by the way, if you read Article 1 of the Utah Constitution, that's kind of like our Bill of Rights, if you will, You'll find that these rights, religious and property and all otherwise, these conscience things, there is no critical mass necessary to have those. You have them. All of us have them. Our business has them. These things are universal. And for laws to say, oh, if you're over this size, you don't have them. Or if you rent this many apartments this year, you don't have them. There's no clarifying statement in there. They're universal. But here's the problem. There are some locations and institutions even that are worried about their institutional right to religiosity. And if you don't have it, 
Sooner or later, theirs will be encroached upon. And I hope someday they come to understand that. Thomas Jefferson said he was a religion of one. Now, I happen to know some of Thomas Jefferson's religious beliefs. He and John Adams corresponded and talked about how the gospel of Jesus Christ had been lost from the world. And they hoped that in their lifetime, although they expected not because they were so old, they hoped that in their lifetime it would be restored. They were on the very cusp. How long? Show me again. Holy cow, good. Uh, <laughs> she gave me 30 more minutes, Dave. <laughs> she, he knows better than that. He can talk to her after. These two wonderful men, they talked about the restoration of the gospel. They said priestcrafts had destroyed it. See, Joseph Smith didn't coin the term priestcraft nor secret combination. Those two terms were in common usage among the American founding fathers. He was using terms that they understood in their day. And you can read in 2 Nephi what a priestcraft is, or you can, you can read President Monson's talk about the political machinations in the world today. They're the same thing, okay? But, but Adams and Jefferson thought that priestcrafts had, ru had ruined the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jefferson read... From the original languages, he had put them in a booklet that he had made. The original languages, the passages of the words of Christ in the New Testament. And he read them in parallel before he went to sleep every night. His entire family did not know anything about this until he was, he was dead. They found this little book by his bed. And it was like, holy cow. And his Bible said, I am a Christian in his own handwriting. So they were Christian. But he believed that the Christian faiths of the day had lost the pure doctrine of Christ. And so he was a religion of one. And his religious belief was every much protected by the Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, as it was for a 16 million member church. It was okay. Couldn't interfere. And so here we have a situation today where the national government is trying to, as narrowly as possible, define religious liberty. And we have our own legislature that is saying it doesn't apply in these instances. Contrary to our Constitution, contrary to the United, well, the Utah Constitution, the United States Constitution, the words of the American Founding Fathers, the words of their mentors, and the words of the Scriptures, ancient and modern. They didn't care. And I don't want any legislators to identify themselves right now, but I would love it if you guys could repeal that, if there's any here. Because it is tragic that in this state, where we fled to this land with the desire to practice our conscience and live our religion in freedom and peace, they're passing laws like that. We don't even have to look to the national government to see that happen. Someday, Dave, you'll have to have me come back and... <laughs> 1849, 24th of July celebration. Boyd Packer in 2008 talked to muy poquito about that, okay? <laughs> you read the whole thing that happened, that Liza R. Snow wrote. It's in a presentation which I give, which is called... LDS, now I know it was before the prophet talked about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the full title. LDS Constitutionalist and Endangered Species. That's the title of my presentation. And in that I review the 1849, 24th of July. At last, the people were free. They had been driven out of the country. The prophets had been killed by the country. The saints had been driven out. They're out here in the West. Finally, they were going to be able to worship their God. And you would be shocked and amazed at how the 12 and the 70 and the prophet talked about liberty or death. At no time will we give these up and we will teach these to our sons and they will be as every bit as committed to these as we are. It was absolutely thrilling to read the talks that were given. Lizar Snow documented them. And like I say, sometime we'll talk about them. But the fact of them, if you're interested, but the fact of the matter is, 
Where are these sons and daughters today? There should be 10,000 people in this room right now. We're the sons and daughters of those God's children who came to this land to worship their God. In the fifth chapter of Isaiah, it talks about my people being led into captivity because of lack of knowledge. And Hosea, in the fourth chapter, says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Who are his people? Five minutes. Dang. Who are his people? Is it your run-of-the-mill, agnostic, secular humanist uh, college professor that worships only the learning of man? Or is it those of us that claim to be disciples of Christ? What did Captain Roni say? So long as there shall be a band of Christians to worship their God and practice their religion, have peace and freedom and take care of their wives and their children, we can't do this if we lose this Constitution. If we lose the First Amendment, that's a huge chunk that we'll be losing. And so my people are destroyed, or my people are led into captivity. And we need to think about that. We have a charge. If you understand these principles spiritually, if you have been hearing in your heart, and I pray to God that somehow, somewhere across this great land, we're going to have a bunch of people raised up. John Taylor's been quoted a couple of times in the 20th volume of his... Uh, of the Journal of Discourse, they see that the elders of Israel would be the last people to step forward to save the Constitution. I know what Joseph Smith said, and he says, and there's several different versions of that. One of is, if it's to be saved at all. But John Taylor, as the president of the church in 1879, said, the elders of Israel will be the last ones to step forward. And I, when I first read that, I was, oh, no. And I thought, wait a minute. That's been my experience for decades. And, and it's a tragic, travesty kind of thing. And I, and I just keep thinking that one of these days, my next door neighbor is going to wake up and say, holy cow, yes, I believe this. And then he'll come to me and say, have you heard this, Scott? And I'll say, what? Haven't, what? <sighs> yeah, well, tell me about it. You know, that's the way it's going to go. Anyway, my friends, if you understood what was at stake and how deep and wide the effort was to destroy our constitutional liberties and the blessings of our ability to worship, not just as an institution, but as individual people. Your children will be taught false doctrine. Oh, wait a minute, they're already doing that in the, the temples of the humanist called public school. We'll have to talk about that someday because we have turned our backs on the true religion of God and accepted a false religion called humanism. It's you know, this guy, Korahor, he was the first one documented in the scriptures. Anyway, here's what I got. I know I got to end. Here's what President Hinckley pled with us about. He said, we are involved in an intense battle. It is a battle between right and wrong, between truth and error, between the design of the Almighty on the one hand and that of Lucifer on the other. For that reason, we desperately need men and women who in their individual spheres of influence will stand for truth in a world of sophistry. I have lived long enough now to know that many political campaigns, for example, are the same. Duh. Some don't even have to campaign. They're anointed and coronated. Uh, and you know who I'm talking about. I have never, excuse me, I have heard again and again the sweet talk that leads to victory, but never seems to be realized thereafter. We need moral men and women, people who stand on principle, to be involved in the political process. Otherwise, we abdicate power to those whose designs are almost entirely selfish. It's a charge. It's a call. To, it's a rally. We've got to be engaged. And I pray that we won't just meet, eat, and retreat. And I had a list of about probably 30 things in my slide presentation that you're not seeing about what you could do personally, individually. But it requires personal engagement. And you've got to realize that what's at stake, it's... It's more highly organized, cleverly disguised, and powerfully promoted than it ever has been before. Ezra Taft Benson told us that. And I think you need to go back and reread re that also. It is something, single acts of tyranny can be the accident of a day. 
But when they happen time after time after time after time, they're by design. Jefferson talked about that too. So I thank you and I, I pray that this group, this band of Christians that is still here upon this land might be a catalyst that can carry these things forth. And I thank you for your time and I'm honored to be here. Thanks a lot.